So this week we're going to look at the miracle, the pool of Bethesda. Next week we're going to look at the healing of the man from Bethsaida. Now we know from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verse 23, that Jesus had worked many miracles in Jerusalem. However, we're not, giving, we're not given many details. Verse 23 reads, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. And that's all we're told. <clears throat> Excuse me. We know that the Lord traveled to Jerusalem on many occasions, and that his visits were planned around the Jewish festive calendar. Now the incident in uh, chapter 7 of John is a clear example of his desire to celebrate the feasts in the holy city. Um, Roger, would you read John chapter 7? So even though he knew the dangers that personally were in front of him, at that particular time, The Lord traveled separately from his relatives and friends. It was important that the Lord should be there to declare how he was the fulfillment of all that the law and offerings foreshadowed. Now, when we turn to John chapter 5, we read that there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. That's in verse 1. So the question remains, what feast was it? In chapter 7, it was the Feast of Tabernacles. And there is support that the feast was Passover, because the only other option is Purim, which wasn't one of those major feasts. In fact, there's also support for this from the miracle itself and with the Passover. Jesus went, after all, to the Sheep Gate. And it was named the Sheep Gate because it was the place where the animals were brought to the temple for sacrifice. There may also have been a market there, since the Gospels tell us that Jesus found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves. At the time of the Passover, the Sheep Gate would have taken on an even more important meaning, because since the Passover lambs were brought to the temple, Jesus, after all, went there as the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. The reason for the gate being named the Sheep Gate might also explain the purpose of the pool. The law describes the need that animals for sacrifice had to be without blemish. From the slides we read that Leviticus 1 verse 3 tells us, if his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he shall offer a male without blemish. In Hebrews 9 and 14, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish? And in Deuteronomy, but if it has any blemish, if it is lame or blind, or has any serious blemish, whatever you shall not sacrifice it unto Yahweh your Elohim. So each animal then that was brought was subjected to examination by the priest. After a warm, hot, and dusty journey, the offerer may have washed his sheep before going into the temple, but it's not possible to say. We can only surmise. The pool was named Bethesda, which means house of mercy. The entire purpose of the sacrifices was to remind the offerer of the abundant mercy of God toward a sinner who repents, prepared to forgive even horrendous sins if men come to him as he commands them. It was at this pool that a group of society's outcasts gathered. They were weak, they were helpless people. They were people in a world that celebrated power, wealth, influence, and authority not unlike societies throughout the history of mankind. They were, as it were, the dregs of humanity. However, they were never rejected or despised by the Lord, as opposed to the leaders of the Jews who were always ready to push them into the background. For example, the Pharisees also favored the rich over the poor because of the prevailing attitude that poverty 
was a sign of the curse of God, while prosperity was believed to show the approval of God on one's life. And all this, despite the fact that Hillel, the great teacher, the great rabbi, was himself a relatively poor man. Anyway, again, this attitude is not uncommon throughout the centuries and perhaps even unto today. On the other hand, Shemai, if that's his name, the other rabbi, went even further in favoring the wealthy, holding the view that only the rich should be taught the scriptures, saying, don't instruct a man unless he is wise, meek, and the son of wealthy parents. This is from the Babylonian Talmud supplement. There was a legend that had built up around the pool and its special qualities. From time to time, the water was turbulent, and for a short time after, it revealed healing properties. The Gaihan Spring, or Fountain of the Virgin, as it's called, in the Kidron Valley, was the main source of water for the Pool of Siloam in the city of David. One of the world's major intermittent springs, and was a reliable water source that made human settlement possible in ancient Jerusalem. The spring wasn't only used for drinking water, but also initially for irrigation of gardens in the adjacent Kidron Valley. And that valley provided a food source for Jerusalem in that ancient settlement. In times past, in times past, this spring was where the women of the city had gone to launder the family's clothes. The field beside that pool is known as Fuller's Field. We look at Isaiah verse seven, I mean chapter seven, verse three, we read, Now said the Lord unto Isaiah, Go forth now to meet Ahaz, thou and Shear Jashub, thy son, at the end of the conduit of the upper pool, in the highway of the Fuller's Field. Isaiah thirty six verse two. And the king of Assyria sent Rabshakeh from Lachish to Jerusalem unto Hezekiah with a great army, and he stood by the conduit of the upper pool in the highway of the Fuller's Field. So geographically, this was an important place throughout the history of ancient Israel. Gihon, of course, Gihon was the place where Solomon was declared an anointed king. So Gion then certainly qualifies as a very important place in history. And now it was to be honored by the presence of the king. The king who was to perform a cleansing and sins to be forgiven. Now the exact mechanism by which these troubled waters healed is not easy to determine. We know that in certain parts of the world, there are mineral springs where certain chemical elements are found, which bring relief to an assortment of diseases and such. Now, this isn't meant to give any credibility to places like uh, Fatima, Lourdes, or even, as I've mentioned several times, St. Anne de Beaupre in Quebec. However, the water does play a large part in bodily health. We are, after all, composed of some 60% water. And water also had a role in the law, as we all know. Skeptics and disbelievers of the Bible, and in particular, the, in the Bible in particular, the healing at Bethesda, these skeptics are especially sensitive to the reference that there was an angel that troubled the waters. They'd rather think it was the minerals. We live, brothers and sisters, in an age that's not prepared or disposed to see Yahweh's hand at work in anything, let alone trying to understand the way he uses things to bring about his purposes. Now, if we turn up Revelation 16, verse 5, we find mentioned in that verse an angel of the waters. I'll read it to you. And I heard the angel of the waters say, Thou art righteous, O Yahweh, which art and wast and shall be, because thou hast judged thus. Now, I know what you're going to say, and you'd be correct. 
But since the Greek word for waters can be used either literally or figuratively, why couldn't Yahweh have worked through this particular angel in the times of the Lord Jesus Christ? At the end of the miracle, Jesus had to remind his critics that my father worketh hitherto, and I work. So what Jesus is saying is that God worketh until now or until this time. He hasn't stopped to work on the Sabbath. He makes the sun to rise on the Sabbath. He rolls the stars on the Sabbath. He causes the grass, the tree, and the flower to grow on the Sabbath. He hasn't suspended his operations on the Sabbath, and the obligation to rest on the Sabbath doesn't extend to him. He created the world in six days and ended the work of creation, but he has not stopped governing it or carrying it forward by his divine intervention. It's impossible to accept the words of the Lord Jesus Christ and reject the continuing work of his Father, maintaining and sustaining his creation. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Hebrews, tells us that the work of the angels is in part the ministering to them who would be heirs to salvation. Of all those who spent their time waiting to benefit from this troubled water, only one was going to be given relief from the great healer. There are many in the world today who also wait, believing there is hope in the efforts of mankind to bring about world peace. But we, brethren, are not fooled. We know that there will be and cannot be, we know that there will be and cannot be any lasting peace until the Prince of Peace manifests himself to the world. Then the healing will begin. And even then, it will take a number of years before the nations fully submit themselves to the will of the King of Kings. The prophet Isaiah reminds us that the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. All who are transgressors of the law and who remain unforgiven. The proposition here is that is therefore of the most general character. All the wicked are like the troubled sea, whether prosperous or otherwise, rich or poor, bond or free, old or young, whether in Christian, in civilized, or in barbarous lands, whether living in palaces, in caves, or in tents, whether in the splendor of cities, or in the solitude of deserts, all are like the troubled sea. And like the troubled sea, they are agitated, ever moving, ever restless, like the sea. It's always in motion and can never entirely be calmed. It also lashes into foam and heaves with wild commotion. Now the words, when it cannot rest, is better rendered by loath. He puts it this way. For it never can be at rest. Not that it can't rest, but it can never be at rest. But the Hebrew is stronger than our translation. It means that there is no possibility of being at rest. It's unable to be still. The Septuagint renders, renders it, but the wicked are tossed like waves and are not able to be at rest. The idea here, of course, as it seems to me, is not exactly that which seems to be conveyed by our translation, that the wicked are like the sea, occasionally agitated by a storm, driven by wild commotion. But like the ocean in general, there's never any peace, and there is no peace to the restless waters of the mighty deep. Anyone who has stood on the shores of the ocean and seen the waves, especially in a storm where it foams it rolls up on the beach, can appreciate the force of this beautiful figure and can't help but have a dramatic image of the unsettled and agitated mind of the guilty. Occasionally, Yahweh's hand can be seen bringing about peace even by the wicked activities of men, but that peace doesn't last. That peace will only become reality in the reign of the Messiah. 
So the one man who was healed was really just representative of the remnant that will be saved. He also possibly represents the nation of Israel that was redeemed from the bondage of Egypt. And how do we come to this conclusion? His illness had imprisoned him for how many years? 38. Which is exactly the period of time that passed during the wilderness journey until all the generation of the men of war. Now the record in John doesn't say that the man had spent all that time waiting by the pool. That would be <laughs> a little far-fetched. Or that he was even 38 years old. But it relates to the time he had suffered from his illness. Whether the five-porched shelter also suggests the weakness of the five books of the law completely to conquer sin is not entirely clear, but it's a possibility. However, the inability of the law is clearly shown by the events that followed the cure. Now, the man's hope of healing seemed dismal. As one of life's disadvantaged, he had no one to carry him to the pool. His life was just an existence with no hope of relief until his illness completed its work. Now Jesus poses the question, Wilt thou be made whole? This is in verse 6. At first it appears that the question is a bit harsh. I mean, why would he be there if he didn't intend to be made whole? But Jesus wasn't referring to an earlier verse that spoke of those who were able to benefit from the troubled waters and were made whole. Verse 4. The RSV brings out more effectively what Jesus really said. Do you want to be healed? The question was a necessary question. In one way, the man had abandoned all hope by coming to this place for a cure. This is what makes pilgrimages in general places of, or pilgrimages to places of healing so pitiful. It's their last stand. This is the shrine of St. Anne de Beaupre, located about 20 minutes from Quebec City. It welcomes almost a million visitors a year, and for over 350 years, people of all ages have been gathering at this shrine dedicated to St. Anne, who they claim was the grandmother of Jesus. Through the beauty of numerous artistic masterpieces, um, stained glass windows, stone and wooden sculptures, and the website says, discover the extraordinary history of St. Anne and the important role she played in the faith of our people. Wax candles as tall as the one healed were often given to churches in return for God's blessings, and bread, cheese, or grain equal in weight to that of a sick child were once common votives given to the poor in return for the same. A particular example of the latter took place in A.D. 1263, allegedly, when a child drowned near the Basilica of St. Anthony in Padua, Italy, as it was still being built. The mother prayed to St. Anthony for his intercession and promised that if her child were restored to life, she would give to the poor an amount of wheat equal to the weight of her child. Of course, her son was saved and her promise was kept. St. Anthony's bread, then, is a votive of giving alms in return for a favor asked of God through St. Anthony's intercession. The giving of St. Anthony's bread takes place on the great saint's feast, ooh, June 13th. And also throughout the year when parents give alms after placing their babies under the patronage of St. Anthony. Now this may be, I don't know how it's looking. Can you determine what that is? Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a big, tall pillar that has crutches on them. On, on either, all around. Allegedly from those that were healed. There's another one, I couldn't find it though, but there is one that has wheelchairs as well. <clears throat> 
Crippled people bring their crutches and wheelchairs to the shrines of saints who've interceded in their healing, and certain shrines have become known for being places where saintly intercession is especially powerful, such as the healing at Lourdes and uh, all the other happy places. Many healings have been granted after praying at the Basilica of St. Anne in Canada. The picture at right shows an almost sculpturesque collection of crutches at that shrine. Of course, what good is a shrine without a bookstore? Spend your money while you're here. Anyway, getting back to the narrative of the healing at the pool, in the same way, we, if we want our preaching efforts to be successful, the hearers need to recognize that there can be no ultimate confidence placed in man's ability to cure the ills of this world. Without recognizing this fact, our best efforts will fall on deaf ears. In the man's answer, there's a great human deception that has plagued mankind ever since Adam said to God, the woman gave me of the tree. This man, you know how he, the blame game went on, the woman, the snake, or the serpent. This man blamed the persistence of his condition on the lack of friends. Maybe his spirit was broken by the disease and he had lost, almost lost, the will to live. And perhaps this is why Jesus asked the question, do you want to be healed? It wasn't harsh. It was, on the other hand, meant kindly. We wonder, had hope completely died within this guy? That he was... That uh, is why the question was asked and what was the question to show? Although there's no evidence of the man's faith, it's impossible to believe that Jesus was unaware of his desire that just needed a little prompting. The reason that any indication of faith is omitted from the record strengthens the opinion that this, like all miracles, had great typical meaning. Only when the realization fully dawns that there is salvation in none other can the miracle of healing truly be accomplished. It was so in this case. The long, the weary years of impotence were ended. The man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. Jesus not only restored him to health, but he gave evidence to those around him that this was a real miracle and that he was really healed. For almost 40 years he had been afflicted. He wasn't even able to walk, and so Jesus commanded him not only to walk, but to take up his bed, lift your bed, and carry that as proof that he was truly made whole. After this exalted ending to Jesus' dealing with the impotent man, it's like being brought back to earth with a jolt when the record adds, and the same day was the Sabbath. A tremendous miracle was in danger of being rebuked on a mere technicality. That was the Sabbath. The Jewish leaders, thinking of themselves as guardians of the law, just couldn't let such a flagrant transgression pass unnoticed. They were blind to the joy that resulted from the fact that one of sin's prisoners had now been set free. They didn't take notice of the fact that he had been now a long time in that case, as verse 6 records it. And instead, they only saw the letter of the law. So they showed that they had always been guided by technicalities and had really missed the whole purpose of the law. Obedience to the commands of God had a purpose. It is your life, Moses told the children of Israel. And so the Lord conveyed himself away. There's no doubt that Jesus stayed near the pool because he would have now been the center of attention, having been disapproved of by the Jewish leaders. The reason he left and the explanation are both given in verse 13. In the following verse, we find the man in the temple. 
perhaps a privilege which he had been deprived all the years of his infirmity. There's nothing more unacceptable when we're raised um, of our hardships than to forget Yahweh, our benefactor, and neglect to praise him for his mercy. And so the Lord warns him to sin no more. And by this expression, it was implied that the infirmity of this man was caused by sin, perhaps by something in his youth. His sin had brought on him this long and distressing affliction. Jesus now shows that he knew the cause of his sickness, and he warns him not to repeat it, or something worse would come of it. Unlike the man who was born blind, the lawyers who questioned this man didn't seem to take the matter to his final conclusion and remove him from the synagogue. It might have been a result of this incident that's recorded in connection with the blind man's healing that the Jews had agreed already that if any man did confess that he was Christ, he should be put out of the synagogue. Being put out of the synagogue refers, of course, to excommunication from the synagogue. Among the Jews, there were two grades of excommunication, one for lighter offenses, of which they mentioned 24 causes, the other for greater offenses. The first excluded a man for 30 days from the privilege of entering a synagogue and from coming nearer to his wife or friends than four cubits. The other was a solemn exclusion forever from the worship of the synagogue, attended with awful curses and an exclusion from all contact with the people. This was called the curse, and so completely excluded the person from all close association with his countrymen that they weren't allowed to sell him anything, even the bare necessities needed for life. It's probable that this latter punishment was what they intended to inflict if anyone should confess that Jesus was the Messiah. And it was the fear of this terrible punishment that prevented the blind man's parents from expressing their opinion. They probably had already started the process. And this would account for the fact that the man, once he learned who had cured him, went to them with the information. In their eyes, once they received this information, they believed that the offense against the Sabbath day laws was committed, not by the man, but by the Lord himself. And neither was it just a mere technical infringement. Only because we are conditioned to their small-mindedness do we read without too great a surprise the words of verse 16. And therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath day. Now the Lord told a man to go his way and sin no more. Why did the Lord go out of his way to find that man in the temple? If he told his disciples not to let one hand know the other hand's good works, was this a Desire for glory? Of course not. In the sinless Son of God, this possibility is out of the question, so there has to be another explanation. And if we read verse 14 carefully, there's no indication that Jesus found the man, especially to tell him who had cured him. What he did was confirm the permanency of the healing maybe in contrast to the healings from the troubled water. And he advised him to change his life. Sin no more, lest worse thing come upon thee. There had been no previous mention of sin at any stage in the process of healing. Was this a case like the Samaritan woman, where Jesus knew all she had ever done? Maybe in this man's life there was a more direct association between sin and suffering than usually happens. And Jesus was warning him that a relapse or repetition would mean serious danger. The warning was of a worse thing. Worse than 38 years of infirmity? The time between youth and age 
had been taken up by this man's illness. Yet something worse could even happen as a result from a life that once again became a servant of sin? No, water, water like, uh, like air through a tube, if it goes through a bend, it produces what they call eddy currents. You know, it, it hits this point, hits that point, and bounces back, and it swirls, and you can see that. Maybe that's the turbulence and, and from a, um, a gush of water that's, you know, not in a small tube, but rather in a big pipe. Well, even, so, even the, you know, the faith healers that walk up to these, these guys and just touch them on the forehead, and then they, they fall back, they're caught, and then they're all set. It, like you said, the mind is a powerful, powerful tool. Could they be energized for a period of time? And then, of course, we don't, there's no follow-up. So we don't know what happens in a week, in a day, two weeks, two months. They could relapse. You know, interesting with, with so little detail. You know, I, I wish there were more. Who brought him there? How far did he get? In all the other miracles, faith was the key to, to, to be healed. So yeah, I think that's, a, that's, that's true. That's a good point. Well, righty then. Oh, our time is up. <laughs>